For this reason, it must be said that nothing is known that is not in experience or as it is also expressed that is not felt to be true, not given as an inwardly revealed eternal verity as something sacred that is believed or whatever other expressions have been used. For experience is just this, that the content, which is spirit, is in itself substance and therefore an object of consciousness. But this substance, which is spirit, is the process in which spirit becomes what it is in itself. And it is only as this process of reflecting into itself that it is in itself truly spirit. It is in itself the movement, which is cognition, the transforming of that in itself into that which is for itself of substance into subject of the object of consciousness into an object of self-consciousness. That is into an object that is just as much superseded or into the notion. The movement is the circle that returns into itself, the circle that presupposes its beginning and reaches it only at the end. Hence, so far as spirit is necessarily this imminent differentiation, its intuited whole appears over against its simple self-consciousness. And since then the former is what is differentiated, it is differentiated into its intuitive pure notion, into time and into the content or into the in itself. Substance is charged as subject with the at first only inward necessity of setting forth within itself what it is in itself of exhibiting itself as spirit. Only when the objective presentation is complete is it at the same time the reflection of substance or the process in which substance becomes self. Consequently, until spirit has completed itself in itself until it has completed itself as world spirit, it cannot reach its consummation as self-conscious spirit. Therefore, the content of religion proclaims earlier in time than does science what spirit is, but only science is its true knowledge of itself. Paragraph 802 begins in a very interesting way with a term that we haven't seen Hegel using an awful lot throughout the phenomenology, and that is experience or erfahrung. And just to go on a little bit of a digression, you know, phenomenology doesn't always mean exactly the same thing. So sometimes people get mixed up saying, you know, we should put the three H's together, Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger, because they're all doing phenomenology. Well, we don't want to get uh, too mixed up about the ways in which they're actually doing what they conceive of as phenomenology. And with, you know, later 20th century phenomenology, uh, we will certainly see a big emphasis on looking to our experience, <clears throat> our oftentimes talked about as lived experience. Now, Hegel is bringing this up, but he's bringing it up as kind of a starting point. So, I mean, you could say in very broad strokes, he's not saying this here, that we really do need to experience in some sense spirit, but what we're experiencing is something that is going to be transformed as, as we're going to see. And he's beginning here by using Erfahrung as a, as I just mentioned, a starting point for these reflections, explaining what it is that, you know, when we're engaging in time, as we've seen, it's very important, right? And in the next paragraph, we're actually going to start talking about human history. So time implicitly includes that. And, you know, we can also talk about um, individuality or particularity. And we can talk about actuality, the actual world, vehicle kite. Those all connect up with experience, don't they? So he is going to uh, talk about expressing experience in several different ways. <clears throat> and each of these is, you could say, a lesser mode of knowing 
or perhaps not even knowing. You know, for example, felt to be true, gefühlt the Wahrheit, right? Um, the truth that is grasped through the mediation of feeling, gefühl. Um, you know, for Hegel, that's kind of a low level of, of uh, grasping something. It's not as good as, it's not as adequate as understanding or representation, let alone the concept or notion, the begriff, right? But, you know, it's not as if it's nothing whatsoever. And, uh, you know, feelings are indeed a significant part of our experience. He also talks about the inwardly revealed eternal reality. And this could mean a lot of different things. You know, bringing up eternal reality takes us all the way back to the unhappy consciousness where the Eviga, the eternal, comes in uh, as something that we're, we're trying to reach out to and not grasping that we ourselves are projecting it way out there, right? But now inwardly revealed. So it's no longer just the unhappy consciousness. It's within us in, in our experience. And then he talks about the sacred, the heiliges, the holy, if you want to, that is believed in, uh, geglaubt, right? And you notice there's a lot of terms here that should remind us of not just the religion section, but the previous forms of religion in here. So let's look at what he says. For this reason, it must be said that nothing is known, right? So we've got Wissen at, at play here that is not in experience. So when things are in experience, we're going to see Hegel talking about a term he's used a lot in this, inhalt, content, right? So the things that are the content, or we might say the object, the Gegenstand of experience. So things are known through experience. Uh, and he says, you know, that it's not felt to be true and are given as an inwardly revealed eternal ver verity as something sacred that is believed or whatever other expressions have been used. So he's not saying um, these are the only things that we could possibly use as stand in for experience. So, I mean, this opens up a, a, a wide range of uh, possibilities. We could talk about not just the experience of the religious, but of being part of a community, uh, being engaged in the quest to find the truly moral comportment or, or action, right? All those could be part of our experience in this. Now, this is, as I mentioned, just going to be the starting point because he says, for experience is just this, that the content, which is spirit, Geist, is in itself substance. He's going to use this word substance here a number of times. He's used it in the previous paragraphs. Substance is less developed, less capable of agency and reflection than is a subject or a self or a spirit or in this case, to science. So, in itself, substance, and therefore an object of consciousness, consciousness, human consciousness, as spirit grasps substance, whatever that substance happens to be. Could be the, uh, you know, stuff in the, the consciousness section, the objects of immediate, seemingly immediate, but a very highly mediated, um, you know, uh, sense perception, the thing and its qualities, um, the different qualities themselves, uh, force and the understanding, laws, world, all, all these sorts of things. And then the subject has to realize its own involvement in this. So he goes on and he says, this substance, which is spirit, okay, so substance isn't just something inert, is the process. Now, process here is translating werden, uh, literally becoming. Uh, it's not a bad translation. Um, Miller's going to use this term process a couple times. Um, but then he's also going to use the word becomes. 
So it can be a little bit confusing. So there is a becoming. There is a transition, a moving from one state to another or, you know, a greater unfolding or a development. So he goes on and he says, um, this substance, which is spirit, is the process in which spirit now, no longer just substance, becomes what it is in itself. And it is only as this process of reflecting, reflectiren, itself into itself, that it is in itself truly spirit. A lot of itselfs there, right? But this is a, a really important truth. Spirit that uh, merely takes the world or the processes, or even in the way in which a lot of people think of science, the objects of science for granted and doesn't comprehend through the, the conscious subject or the self-conscious subject, what its own involvement is, is not getting the full picture. Is actually, as we saw in the previous uh, paragraph, in revealing, there's also concealing. So at this point in the game, spirit, you and me, and the phenomenologist, that is Hegel, ought to be further along we might say, right? So going on a little bit further, um, he says, it is in itself the movement, the Bewegung, which is cognition, erkentness. Now notice, we've got Wissen and we've got erkentness, both of which were used in the previous paragraph. Cognition is not yet knowing, let alone uh, begreifenness, uh, you know, begreifliches, conceptual knowing that we want right here. But uh, cognition is going to be a set of what Hegel is going to say, transformings of different things. The in itself into the for itself. You know, always doing this, right? In, in the Hegelian dialectic. But also substance into subject. We'll come back to that in just a minute, because that's, that's quite important. And then, getting a little bit more complex, the object, the Gegenstand, what it is that is presented to it, against it, right? Of consciousness, transforming that into the object of self-consciousness. Now that requires some explanation as well, but notice that there's one more thing that's being added here. That means, as he's going to say, uh, das heißt, i.e., into an object that is just as much, eben so, superseded, aufgehobenen Gegenstand, right? So we've got object for consciousness, or the object of consciousness, the object of self-consciousness. Then we have the object superseded, and this is what the object of self-consciousness is raised to a higher level, uh, what is essential in it, uh, encapsulated, what is unessential, left behind. And what is this? This is the notion, the concept, the begriff, right? The object of self-consciousness in this discussion is the concept. It, you grasp it conceptually. And that is how you are your self-consciousness. You're not self-consciousness just by relating yourself to another self-consciousness, as we saw way, way back when. You're not self-consciousness by desiring recognition from the other self-consciousness. That, that's part of it, right? But that is what has to be auf gehobenes, that, or you know, raised to a higher level, uh, superseded, sublated, right? Transformed while being incorporated. So we have here this interplay moving from just being conscious of an object to being conscious of ourselves as conscious of the object, as grasping the object, as being involved in this process and thereby having notional, conceptual grasp of the substance, the object. And we can say at this point, well, what the hell is the substance here? Well, we're going to get to that. Well, let's come back to thinking about what it means to be transformed into 
a subject, or as he's going to say a little bit later, a self. So what is the subject? We've talked about this before in the commentary when we contrasted these different S's, substance, self, spirit, um, subject. So a subject is able to take stances, comportments towards other things as consciousness that has objects, as self-consciousness that has objects in a richer way, right? So the subject... If substance is being transformed into subject, it has to become aware of its very own self. And this is part of what spirit indeed is. Spirit, this entire uh, dialectic, and what is driving it, what its substance at first is, and then later subject and self will be, is something that relates itself to other things, and also to itself in that process. Getting to know itself, come back to the experience that we seem to have left behind. You know, Hegel's not saying this here, but we could read that in and say, this is the experience of spirit, is it not? So he goes on and he tells us, uh, the movement is the circle that returns into itself. Now, you know, this is where people start talking about the Ouroboros, you know, the snake that's swallowing its own tail and all that sort of stuff. And they're like, ooh, this is so cool. Sometimes they're like, ooh, very mystical and stuff like that. And I think Hegel, in this presentation uh, on his own part, can be a bit misleading because what we're not talking about here is starting at point A, going around the circle and winding back at point A, or endless repetition in cycles. Transformation is taking place, and you're not arriving just back at point A, but point A transformed. Point A reconnected with the rest of the circle. Point A that is conscious of itself as having developed more. This is very, very important. You, you should not lose sight of this in this language about circles. As a matter of fact, I much prefer thinking in terms of spirals, spiraling in on, on something, or you know, a circle that becomes um, more developed as it goes on. Anyway, he says, um, the movement is a circle that it returns into itself. The circle that presupposes its beginning and reaches it only at the end. So we don't have like cycle after cycle. We have one circle here, right? One go around. And it's a big, big go around. So it comprises like this entire work. We're not quite there yet. And it would presumably involve uh, human history and the development of consciousness over time through all these different shapes of consciousness that Hegel has charted out for us at this, this point. All right, so going on. He says, hence, insofar as spirit is necessarily this imminent differentiation. Now, we saw the discussion about differentiation in the previous paragraph, right? So we've got, we've got two things going on got all this differentiation, um, imposing distinctions, dividing is another way of talking about it. And we're also going to have this process of completion or consummation. So we've got, you know, uh, Unterscheiden and we've got uh, Vollendung or, uh, you know, all sorts of verbal uh, compositions of this as well. And these are connected to each other. Spirit is necessarily this imminent differentiation. It's, it's, you know, broken into a bunch of different things. It's intuited whole. We saw whole or totality in the last paragraph being brought up as a key part of this as well. Appears over against its simple self-consciousness. Now we saw, you know, self-consciousness, again, just in previous paragraphs, um, individual self-consciousness, universal self-consciousness, self-consciousness of the knowing person at this point in the phenomenology is both of these together. And it's sort of like a composite picture of 
what the subject or the self is. So, um, since then, the former, what is the former? The intuited whole is what is differentiated. It is differentiated into its intuited pure notion into time. Pure notion, pure concept. Um, and we saw this being brought up as well, right? That was sort of a middle point um, before the, we had the pure notion and then we had time as this differentiation that's, that's taking place. Um, so it's intuited pure notion into time uh, and into the content or into the in itself. So the intuited pure notion is itself differentiated we could say along the lines of time and through time and by time, and yet it's more than just time. This is where we're going to get to history a little bit later. But it's also a completion or a consummation, a full ending, as we're going to see. Right? So he goes on and, and says that substance is charged. So substance is transforming into subject, it is charged as subject with the at first only inward necessity, a necessity that has to be brought to light, um, of setting forth within itself what it is in itself, of exhibiting itself as spirit. Now, it sounds like we've got a, a further task to do, but this is something that spirit has been doing this entire time. It's just not completely finished yet. Or maybe it is finished, and now we're just realizing <laughs> that it's finished, according to Hegel. So he says, only when the objective presentation is complete. Now, complete here is folendita. So what is it to be completed in this sense? To be brought to all of its potential, to be uh, transformed into its highest, most developed, and also most conscious state that it can reach. And it turns out, you know, I mean, some things, this piece of chalk, not a lot of potential in that sense in this. I mean, it can be used to discuss consciousness, but it's not conscious. And I can be conscious of it. I can use it as, an, as a tool. Uh, the book, uh, you know, insofar as object, basically like a piece of chalk, insofar as containing the mind of somebody called Hegel, maybe there's more going on there, right? It's a sort of record, a compendium that we can engage with. Now, you and me, we are... Subject, our self, our spirit, our mind can be brought to a much, much higher level. And we can do so much more when we think conceptually, which means thinking as uh, self-consciousness, which partly takes itself as its own object and other self-consciousnesses, and not just the other self-consciousness over there, but those that we've seen in, in time, the ones that led us up to this point. So, uh, objective presentation, gegenständliche, right, objective. Um, well, we've got, we've got here the object of consciousness, the object of self-consciousness. That's what he's talking about, this transformation. And then presentation is Darstellung, not Vorstellung, Darstellung, putting, putting it out there, um, presenting it, right? So that is what has to be completed when the objective presentation is complete, only then is it at the same time the reflection of substance or the process, the Vedan, in which substance becomes, here he says, self. Self and subject here, really two ways of talking about the same thing. So that's what we're doing. That's what Hegel thinks has happened now for spirit and we can reap the benefits of it, so to speak. We're getting to this, you know, final end point of the history of human consciousness developing, which just happens to finish up with Hegel himself. Very convenient, you might say. But also Hegel thinks absolutely necessary. 
there is an epistemological grounding that's happening here, right? And this is something we've discussed in the past. So let's let's dwell on this a moment. Um, Hegel thinks very clearly that you know the meaning of history is to be found after history has essentially finished up its processes of development and spirit can look backwards at it. That's what the phenomenologist is doing and see all the different developmental shapes or stages and how they led to each other through a kind of necessity, not a logical necessity, not a mathematical necessity, but a this uh, had to somewhere lead to this happening and this is a superior state and so that it goes on from there. So he says, until spirit has completed itself in itself, until it has completed itself, now he introduces this as world spirit. Now, we're going to talk about history again in, in you know, the coming paragraphs. And Hegel has you know, lectures on world history and all that. We, we can go into that later. World spirit. When you're seeing world spirit here, think of the spirit of a totality, a, a gans, the whole, but in time. Right? The whole world. Doesn't mean every part of the world is actually as connected with or exemplifying spirit as much, but somewhere spirit has to be doing this. Just so happens that it's in Europe and, you know, very conveniently for Hegel again, um, in, in the, you know, Western Europe, England, France, Germany, and mostly in Germany, right? Where he happens to be doing his, uh, his work at the time. So uh, he says, it cannot reach its consummation, its, its finality, its um, being brought to its, its highest state as self-conscious spirit. Therefore, the content of religion, so all these things that we're talking about with erfahrung or experience, proclaims earlier in time than does science what spirit is. But... There's a superiority that science, Wissenschaft, which works with concepts and not just representations, Vorstellungen, has over religion. Religion is like philosophy, just not as fully self-conscious, not as fully developed as science, which is what Hegel views himself as doing through his philosophy, as science is. And so religion is great. Actually, art is also going to be great. You know, you notice that in the phenomenology, art got rolled into religion in later works. Hegel will have both religion and art as like leading up to philosophy and not just any old philosophy, but dialectical philosophy, right? Because there's also philosophy of the understanding, a whole, whole other topic there. So he says um, the content of religion, the inhalt, um, what we experience, we get that earlier in time, then we get genuine Wissenschaft or science, uh, science is spirit's true knowledge of itself. And you might say, oh, that's not how I understand science. Probably not, because we live in a time in which we tend to think of science much more in terms of being uh, what it is that we study, and then we have things for the object of consciousness, or perhaps the object of self-consciousness. You know, we study psychology as opposed to, say, biology. And, you know, with psychology, it's a little bit easier for us to say, oh, this does apply to me, right? But Hegel is saying this has to apply to the totality of human development. That's what genuine Wissenschaft in the full sense is going to be and provide us with. <clears throat> so we have some pretty important transformations here. Now, I think we can actually, again, outside of the text, I think we can actually ask an important question here. So, you know, he's talking about having reached a certain state, having completed things. Uh, let's grant that. We do have to have like gone along the way and we can talk about least complete perhaps with, you know, uh, sense certainty and then more and more and more and more complete, can't we? With religion 
itself being a whole uh, set of, you know, this is more complete, this is more complete, this is more complete. Hegel is saying, until you actually get to the end, you, where things are complete, you can't adequately judge how complete each stage is. And there's something to that. You know, each of the stages that we've gone through presents itself to us as if it is the final stage. And, you know, we get used to this through reading the phenomenology. We're like, oh, you know, it looks like we're done here. And then Hegel's like, nope, that's not the case. Uh, and sometimes it's like, let's move on to the next subsection. You know, let's introduce a couple inter interesting ideas to, to grapple with. And sometimes it's like, we're going to move from reason to spirit or spirit to religion, a whole new portion of the phenomenology. And I, and I suppose you could say that the breaks between reason and um, spirit or self-consciousness and reason or uh, spirit and religion are not as big of a jump as from the consciousness to the self-consciousness section. That is, that is a, a significant rupture there. But we can, we can grasp um, why it had to be that way, according to Hegel, at the end, which is where we are now, we only have, you know, we're in paragraph 802. Um, there's only 808 paragraphs in the whole work. So we only have six more paragraphs to go to finish this up to, you know, see entirely what we're supposed to have been brought to the edge to look over. Uh, I mean, also to look back and understand. So, you know, there's, there's quite a lot going on here. As I mentioned, he isn't yet talking about um, history yet. He's talking about time, but we're going to get into history right in the next paragraph early on. So you can start anticipating that from where we're sitting as we go through this, this paragraph and the role that experience cognition, knowledge, and then finally science play in this entire process of development, of distinction, and then the completion of spirit.